let me just shrink that down to make sure it's the right size. Can you see the full slide now? Yes, 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 yes correct. Excellent, excellent. Okay, let's get started. And um, someone's going to have to shout out because I can't see you anymore now. So if you want to speak, um, I don't mind if people call out. It's all good. So once again, good afternoon and thank you all for sticking around. Um, we are a little behind time, but that's okay. We will. We uh, we said that we are going to make this flexible, so we're making this flexible. I'll do my best to keep us on track. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is the SPREP and SPTO or um, Pacific Tourism Organization's joint EIA guidelines for, for coastal tourism development in the Pacific region. So um, these were a lot. Back in 2018, they were launched and endorsed by the SPREP members and SPTO members. Um, and the objectives of the guidelines are twofold. Firstly, to ass assist the tourism sector in the region to understand better um, implementation of the EIA um, process. That's the environmental impact assessment process. For those of you who have just learned the acronym today, congratulations. Um, and when for when they're planning developments. And secondly, to promote sustainable development. That's that's it, promote sustainable development. Now, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the content of the actual guidelines. I can quickly show you what they look like. Um, so they look like this. And they're, um, they're only about 40 pages and they uh, contain all sorts of useful information, uh, tips, um, triggers for what might constitute the need for an EIA, and I welcome you to request a copy from Ivan, who will be more than happy to supply it. And for all of those of you who have attended today and provided your email addresses, we can also give you an e-copy of it. And please also join the PNEA. Um, that's the Pacific Network of Environmental Assessment. It's a website that um, Ivan runs uh, for the EMG group. It's about the uh, community of practice for environmental assessment. And once you're signed up and you, you log in there, you can download a whole heap of documents and you can read them and you can disperse them to your heart's content. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today in this session is the guidelines themselves, the Regional Tourism EIA guidelines. I'll introduce the guidelines and then we'll talk about what the guidelines are supporting. So, you know, why do tourists come? And then why is an EIA important for your development? Well, we've heard from the legal aspect and Tamara also very kindly touched on the point, it's gonna save you money. It's gonna save the proponent money. It's gonna save them from having to, to um, redo studies or to um, you know, basically potentially knock down buildings uh, if you do the EIA. But it goes a little bit further than that in saving money and saving the environment. And hopefully um, we'll all get a better understanding of that as these three days go on. And again, thank you all for coming because I know you are all very busy people. And it's always remarkable to me when I hear how fewer EIA regulators that we have um, in the offices for the national, um, national agencies. Four people dealing with 80 um, development applications um, per month and they only get 10 days to respond and they're giving us three days to, to come along today. So uh, yeah, thank you for, for making yourselves available. So we'll talk about the benefits of proper planning and I'll try and provide some example mitigation measures and, uh, and also some case studies in regards to where things have not gone so well because that was a request from MNRE. So first of all, why are tourists coming to the Pacific? Well, they come here because they're looking for cultural and environmentally friendly options. Um, some holiday makers, they're just here for the sites. They're just here to relax. But more and more um, tourists are coming here and they're looking for low impact attractions. They're looking for things that make them feel good, that they've spent their time in a place that's protecting the environment and somehow they've contributed to, to helping not only your economy, but help preserve your environment um, and help support um, activities and organizations that are doing their best to, um, to, to keep the environment safe for future generations. So what sorts of things are attracting them? So. Coral reefs. Coral reefs are a big draw card for a lot of tourists in, in the Pacific region. They come to see the corals. They come to see the fish that live amongst the corals. They come for the snorkeling. Um, they just come sometimes to just look out at the beautiful waters because wherever you have your coral reefs, 
you usually have nice clean lagoons you've got your turquoise waters it's it's stunning areas so but coral reefs do more than look pretty we know this and those of us in mnre and others will know they help to improve water quality they attract um rain life they support fisheries um, they also attract tourists obviously um, they also protect your your nation they provide a natural protection from storm events um, and provide safe harboring waters um, for shallow craft. So fringing reefs and lagoon reefs um, have multifaceted um, importance. And uh, things that we have to think about when we're, we're putting in a new development is how is this going to impact the reef? So um, we need to protect these areas because impacts that occur can, can be increased pressure on fishing for local restaurants because you want to service um, you know, the, the tourists have come. Potential souvenir trades, if they're, you know, people breaching um, conventions and, and going out and harvesting species. Uh, poorly managed waste disposal from, from areas and poorly guided tours themselves. Um, boats can damage coral reefs, as we all know, if they, if they land on top of a reef or if they even just, um, the wake from a boat can break some of the more fragile corals and even provide um, scars within seagrass areas. Uh, so the EIO process can identify key objectives of the project and sensitive iconic areas that you want to try and have minimal impacts on and preserve because that's your attraction to your, to your, um, to your development. You don't want to disrupt that. A properly um, conducted EIA can also in integrate cultural knowledge. So um, it can draw upon the understandings of the peoples in the region, um, especially for community-led um, tourist operations. It's really good to get the, um, the locals involved. This is, this is a win-win for multiple reasons because um, one, you gain their cultural knowledge, which is, can help to interweave into, into your development um, and get better understanding because often there's a lack of environmental data. Two, it's, it's a really good stakeholder engagement exercise and you get to understand them better and they get to understand what the development's objectives are and how it's going to benefit them. So as Tamara said, early engagement and early communication is really important. So um, the sooner a developer starts talking to those potentially affected communities, the better for them. Um, it's really important that the developer communicates um, honestly and openly um, with the community that it's going to operate in. Uh, many of the traditional skills that are being used at the time in during lockdowns, um, these are coming back into play in villages, people going back and, and working the land again. A lot of the tourism operators themselves are having to send their staff back to the villages to work. So um, this is where the people are coming from. This is where um, staff come from when new developments occur too. Uh, it's important that we continue to support these cultural practices and emphasize how they provide long-term sustainability. This is also a draw card for, for tourists. They want to know about the Pacific culture. They want to feel that they're supporting it. And it doesn't just go for the Palangi who are coming. It's also for a lot of um, Pacific who are coming back to reconnect and, and, and trace their heritage. Of course, you've got other tourists who just want to come here and fish and um, do exciting activities. Um, but ultimately, this still relies on the attractions being viable and the natural environment being sustainable. You can't have tourist operators go out fishing if there's no fish. If the reefs decline, they're not going to catch anything and quickly that tourist venture will, will collapse itself. So um, tourism brings opportunities, but it also brings impacts. And these are the things we need to think about managing. Um, yes, as Tamara said, it's very important that when you're doing a development, we consider the positives of that development and we em we emphasize how they are going to enhance the the livelihoods of everybody involved in that development and those who are fringe benefiters so secondary industries that's a really good way of of helping your development get approved um, but we have to also manage those negative impacts so that's what these guidelines are, are sort of designed to help with now as Tamara mentioned, we have legal obligations when we're doing an EIA and they fall under the, the act and the regulations. And then under those are the supporting um, codes of practice, policies, guidelines, strategies, and, and other government um, initiatives. These are not legislation. These guidelines are not legislated. They're not a law. You're not bound to them. 
they are purely developed to help you if you want to refer to them or if your proponent um, uh, developers want to look and refer to them we encourage them to do so because it outlines the importance of stakeholder engagement and the types of studies they might to do to support their development have we got a question from the floor no can I do oh, sorry i could just hear some voices that's all um so why are these eia guidelines needed um hopefully those of you who are in the room already sort of understand the importance of an EIA and that it's not a roadblock. Hopefully we've already started to emphasize that. Um, developments in different economic systems have uh, sectors have the potential to provide substantial benefits. So we know the tourism sector is one of the biggest GDP um, providers um, within the Pacific. Um, before COVID, it was possibly the biggest for many of the countries, um, especially in Fiji and others that were heavily reliant on tourism. So that's really driving the reopening of borders. Um, increasing the provision of goods and services that come also raises the standards of living. So when one sector um, grows and tourism is a, key, a, a good example of this, um, it brings in other benefits. Tourists come in and they spend money, not just in the resort, they spend money outside the resort and the resort itself needs to draw on other resources to um, feed those people in the resort and it has to employ people from um, within the region um, and it brings in skills, it brings in all sorts of things, um, opens up livelihood opportunities, people who would maybe um, never thought to work in tourism or um, what would they do once they finish high school. Is there a question from the floor? I just got pinged. No, nope, I'll continue. Okay. Um, it also improves the national regional um, transport services and networks because you need to maintain these in order for um, tourism to um, be successful, i.e. you need good airports and you need good internal transport. Um, and it facilitates access to international markets and foreign exchange, so I, it's bringing in money from overseas. So we need the guidelines to help developers identify how they are going to benefit the country as well as benefit themselves and how their development is not going to impact on any of these key, key objectives for the nation, as well as not impacting on the natural environment. But what happens if it's not properly applied? Well, there's a whole suite of things and we've heard a few examples raised already. So obvious ones, you can, um, you can destroy the natural habitat and loss, which is, is the draw card for many of these tourism operators. If they don't plan them properly, they could end up polluting waterways and you know, killing off wildlife. They can remove too many trees, destabilize soils. Um, generation of waste and pollution. Waste and pollution is a massive problem in the Pacific, most of which is not the doing of the Pacific, but the lifestyles as well that we have adopted within the region, which is the consumerist lifestyle of importing things from overseas and with plastic wrappers and disposable um, containers. Um, this is contributing to the, the massive um, solid waste problem we have within the region. Um, we get marine waste that washes up on our shores. Thank you very much for the rest of the world. Um, but we also are importing a lot of waste and development, new development brings in a lot of that waste too. Packaging materials for construction um, and all of, all of the related waste materials. Release of greenhouse gas. Um, construction releases a lot of greenhouse gas. Cement is one of the biggest, and production of cement is one of the biggest contributors to CO2 emissions on the planet. So every time you um, import a bag of Portland cement, that's the cement mixing um, product used to bind your aggregate, um, there's a huge amount of CO2 that's gone into producing that. And then if you're having to even burn your own lime, which is re removing corals from the and or seashells, again, that's taking um, some CO2 and releasing that into the atmosphere while you produce the energy to produce that lime. Or, and that's been done for the Portland cement too. So transport costs, all these things and construction produce a lot of CO2 emissions. And then you have freshwater depletion. When you're making up cement, you need to use water. So if you're in an area where there's not a lot of water, um, you've got to consider these things when you're, uh, when you're making up your uh, your plan because what's going to happen during drought situations? What are the people in the area going to drink if you're using all the cement, um, all the water for cement? Um, there's a potential for a spreading of invasive plants and animals. When you clear land, it's basically an area for opportunistic species to come in. So if you don't manage your land area um, appropriately, um, birds will come in and drop fresh seeds and 
or seeds will be sitting there in the seed bank and just sprout and you'll be covered in weeds. Um, wild animals can be attracted through poorly managed waste and scraps, uh, rats, etc., can infest buildings. Um, you can unfortunately sometimes even import new species if you're bringing in new materials. Um, so having a good invasive management plan is important. Um, intrusion upon villages and communities and their lifestyles. If you haven't done your consultations properly, you don't know where your boundaries end. You haven't really followed through with the commitments where you promised um, certain involvement of the community. This can psychologically damage the community. Um, people thought they were going to get a benefit and they suddenly don't. Um, it can really create a lot of ill will. Um, generation of social tension then follows and um, potential loss of livelihoods if someone's no longer able to fish in an area because the reef's been destroyed or the mangroves have been removed. Uh, damage of cultural heritage sites. Um, this, is a, this is a problem if people, um, everything's um, in spoken law and it's not documented well and people are reluctant to come forward and explain the importance of heritage sites before development goes in. And then too late after development has started, then these, this information comes to light. So this is again, why it's really important to have those early conversations, open conversations so that people feel they can trust you with this information so that they feel then safe that you're going to um, avoid the impacts on their heritage sites. Damage and loss of physical infrastructure. If you don't know where the drainage or the power lines are, this could be big problems. Um, you could end up costing, um, your project a lot of money when you have to rectify any damage you've done to government infrastructure, as well as compensate people who've lost running water or electricity. So it's really important when you're designing your project that you know where all the sensitive receivers are. That's not just the natural ones, this includes the physical ones. You don't want to damage other people's property. So what is an EIA or environmental impact assessment and what is it doing? Well, it's meant to identify mitigation measures. It's meant to enhance the positive impacts and to avoid and minimize, rehabilitate where possible and even compensate for negative impacts. When I say compensate though, I don't necessarily mean monetarily. I mean um, replantation areas or reestablishment of um, protected areas um, where things can thrive outside of influence um, from your development or actually benefit from your development, providing them with a secure and safe location. Um, so negative compensation for negative impacts isn't necessarily always financial. And I know that's the first thing people think of when they hear that word. So I just wanna make sure that you understand that. Um, it's a participatory process. As Tamara said, developers are encouraged to come in very early on and have a free consultation and talk through their development. Um, people should, not be thinking, I don't want to talk to the government because they're just going to tell me no from the very beginning. Um, if, they, if they go in and they meet with Puma and they meet with the other agencies, they can quickly identify all the key issues with their project and even come up with ways to help address those issues. Um, and it's an ongoing process. So stakeholder engagement um, might throw up a few things that even the government didn't think about. Um, there's the customary landowners. So you need to make sure that um, everything is well documented. So really important throughout the EI process, document everything. The minute you have the idea or they come, someone comes to you with an idea, ask them, what is your document keeping process? Make sure that you're keeping everything on record. That includes meetings with people, the outcomes of meetings, things that have been agreed, actions that have been taken. Who did you talk to? How old are they? Where do they live? What's their relation to the development? Are they a key stakeholder? Are they just a concerned body? Are they a regulatory agency? What was the outcome of those discussions? It's supposed to support informed decision-making. So that's why you need to document everything. You need to be able to demonstrate that you have thought about this and you've recorded everything. It's not just the environmental impacts as in the natural environmental, um, so water quality and everything, but you know, documenting those social aspects too. It's not a roadblock. I cannot reiterate this enough. It is not meant to stop your development from happening. It's meant to promote sustainable development. As Tamara said, is to identify those hurdles or those big costs that if you don't address them early on, that are going to cost you money later. Um, it can even save you um, a lot of money in the long run. Um, 
developments in Australia where they've gone through the EIA process early on, they, they redesign the layout. A lot of people come with an idea and they go, this is how it has to be. I've got this much land and I know exactly what I want. But when you do the EIA process, you might reveal that you're sitting within a flood prone region and you might need to increase the level of your foundations or look at setting things back further from waterways, putting in some fortifications, or maybe even relocating your, your, uh, your initial area into one that's in, in a more appropriate location. And this could save you a lot of money um, because you wouldn't have to rebuild later if you're, if you're flooded out. So important outcomes from the EIA process, and we're gonna hear about more of these, particularly the EEMP or the Environmental Man Management or Monitoring Plan um, on Friday session. First one, selection of an optimal development site and a design. So an optimal design is the optimal concept design. We don't need the detailed design for EAA. So what is the optimal layout for your development? What's the optimal size? And this could be both driven by your finances that are available at the time, and as well as the, the physical environment. And reducing the vulnerability of, um, to environmental hazards. So it's not all about your impact on the environment, it's taking into consideration the impact of the environment of your development. Um, and in Tonga recently, we have seen the impacts of tsunamis, um, and this was mostly due to um, low-lying areas. Um, in the Pacific, we have a lot of those, and in coastal tourism developments, they're usually in the front line. So having um, plans in place and thinking about how your development is going to be able to withstand um, cyclone events and sea level rise because sea level rise is happening. And so how long before the footings of your building uh, are being lapped at by, by um, sea level rise? There are models that predict this and um, MNRE has been doing them for parts of Samoa. So you can actually see predicted inundation rates. Okay. So a bit more about the guidelines and you know, what we're, we're, we're thinking about. So the guidelines talk about mostly the coastal regions, but it's important to realize within the Pacific, um, most islands sit within the, what's deemed a coastal zone because the coastal zone is everything within the catchment. So it's the highlands down to the waterline. So it's not uncommon for entire islands to be within what's called the coastal zone. Um, in Samoa, uh, we have some upper upper lands areas, so um, not all of them are within the coastal, but they all potentially have an impact on the coastal region because they're usually near waterways, which then flow out into the reef areas. And so water um, contamination can be an issue that you have to consider. So be it for small or large scale tourism developments, the EIA principles need to be applied. As we heard from Tamara, all development applications in Samoa have to go through Puma for consent, and then they'll decide whether or not an EIA is required. And if an EIA is required, whether or not it will be just a preliminary EIA or a comprehensive one. So things to consider within your EIA. Um, this is another concept diagram. So when you're placing your development, within an area, um, how does it interact with the other existing industries and activities within that area? Have we got a question? Oh no, we've got somebody trying to be admitted. Okay, so there's a lot of things that can be going on. And as you know, there's a lot of things that even happen within one particular land holding. So you can have agriculture going on. There can be a, there can be a village there, there can be sports fields, there can be land clearance operations and construction, there can be a quarry there. There's um, potentially forestry. Um, within the marine environment, you've got your natural um, coral reefs as well as um, traditional fishing and even small scale commercial coastal fishing. And there might be marine protected areas. Um, so how does your coastal development or how does the planned coastal development fit within that landscape and what possible impacts could the development have on those existing um, activities and uh, developments, as well as the other way around. So if the coastal um, area is being used um, regularly for I don't know, logging operations are, are, are going up and down that road or there's a quarry nearby, I mean, there's going to be noise impacts from those operations on the actual tourist um, development. So has the tourist operator thought about that? Um, and vice versa, you know, when construction's going on and we have our uh, 
uh, hopefully at some point we we end up having our um our big events back on and there's music festivals going on how are those um events going to impact on the local residents car parking all those things and then drilling down maybe a little bit more specifically about impacts um that are sometimes within the remit of the development but not necessarily under the full control of of the development we have a lot of unfortunately coral bleaching events and coral impacts that are occurring in the region um the main triggers for these are um uh, are rising temperature levels um seawater levels and we have warnings that go out for for peak times that we might experience a bleaching event but bleaching events are not just solely caused by um, rising temperatures. They're also, um, it's caused by the ultimately a tipping point within those corals. And the more stressed those corals are, the more likely they are that they're going to bleach or not recover from a bleaching event. So these other stresses are things that are sometimes within um, the ability of a development to, to, uh, to minimize. So uh, runoff from pesticides and nutrient levels um, impacting reefs, so pesticides, um, they're designed to kill things. Herbicides too. Um, corals are living creatures and they consist of both um, plant and animal material. So herbicides can kill off their, um, their symbiotic um, plant zoanthelae that produce um, the photosynthesis that helps the coral to grow. And the um, pesticides can kill off the animal, the polyps themselves. So you end up with a very stressed organism and unable to recover quickly if it's, uh, or at all, if it has a heat stress event. And eutrophication can encourage other things like turfing algae to overgrow um, the, the corals. Um, corals are really good at drawing down nutrients and filtering water, but if they're too stressed and there's too many nutrients in the water and there's too many pesticides or herbicides, they, they will collapse. So, um, Developments are encouraged to put in mitigation plans and talk to their neighbours about how they're managing their water quality as well. Water quality monitoring plans are also really beneficial for your development. Um, seagrass areas are also um, not so necessarily always um, as much of an attraction to tourists. Um, in temperate regions, people come to see um, seagrass meadows within the Pacific. Seagrass meadows are a good health indicator. So if you've got seagrass and um, coral, that means your lagoon's really healthy because you've got um, habitats for different um, stages of fish. Um, and the, the seagrass are also doing their part in stabilizing sediment, which is helping to protect the corals from being smothered, as well as helping to draw down nutrients. So if you've got seagrass and corals, you've got a very healthy um, lagoon. Seagrass can also help to temper um, wave action um, if they're longer seagrasses. So what we're trying to achieve, um, another uh, concept diagram, people seem to uh, respond to this. Ultimately, we want to be looking at something that's more akin to the, uh, the right-hand side of your screen. We want to uh, promote this type of development where you've got your mangroves and your reefs still um, thriving. You've got your upland vegetation. You haven't removed too much of, of the forestry around your development. You have, haven't had to rely on artificial um, reinforcements to protect waterways or you from um, coastal intrusion. Um, and you really, really don't want to have a highly impacted area where you've basically removed all your natural fortifications. Um, you've impacted on water quality. You've depleted or removed all of your um, local fish stocks and your roads are being constantly inundated because they haven't been planned properly and your development is um, being threatened by either landslide or flooding. And basically it fails because you don't attract tourists. So by having proper planning in place and the proper mitigation, that's what we're, we're trying to aim to achieve. And the guidelines set out some um, key things to look out for when you're planning your development. So it's important that while we strive to keep the island economies going throughout the lockdown and when we're preparing for the reopening that we don't forget of the borders that is, um, we don't forget the importance of the long term sustainable planning and SBTO will talk about that a bit more um, tomorrow. Um, whether the developments are privately funded, donor driven by, the, by um, investment banks or government initiatives, they all still subject to the same laws and governments 
um, within the country. So um, a lot of times people think government agencies don't have to put in an EIA. No, we all know that that's not true. Everybody has to do it. Um, and what I hope that people take away from these sessions is that it's actually there to help you, help you make a better plan development. The EIA process is not just a box tick for approvals. It actually should be used as an iterative process to help redesign your planned um, development. If the environmental management plans are properly developed, that's through um, understanding the environment, understanding the stakeholders, understanding what's needed during construction and operation, um, coastal developments can actually lead to improved environmental outcomes. Um, the image that I'm showing at the top of that particular slide is the Tonga um, domestic ferry terminal. When they plan that to go in, the water quality in that area was actually really bad. Um, and they didn't have any seagrass in that, in that area. Um, DRICA came in and helped them do the EIA and the construction for this particular um, terminal. Um, as a result, um, they did a really good EIA and the water quality in the area and even the seagrass has, um, has recovered. Um, so developments don't always have to have completely negative impacts. They can actually, if done properly and you um, work out how to treat water and capture um, runoff, um, can actually have really positive benefits for the for the natural environment too and even help to manage things like erosion. But if you get it wrong, um, you can have all sorts of problems. So during construction operation, it's important that you're constantly managing things such as your liquid waste discharge um, with appropriate containment and treatment of waste to prevent the negative impacts on the waterways, plants, animals, people. Um, and unfortunately, when you fail on one aspect of your environmental management, it's often an indicator that you're failing in other areas. I've been to construction sites where I picked up this discharge pipe where they sort of snuck it underneath um, at the bottom of the river, they'd sunk it through the river and then having it discharge on the other side of the river. Um, Joppa and I had seen this in um, Solomon Islands. Um, so that you know, the regulator didn't actually, when they came to site, they didn't actually spot that this was actually happening because this is outside what's their physical footprint, but this is obviously within their area of influence. And we also found um, within that vegetation there, within that warning glory, that, that climbing vine on the ground, a lot of um, what was obviously construction waste that had been dumped in amongst there. So um, as Tamara said, if people don't comply with their approvals, they could have these revoked. So. Yeah, we pointed this out when we we're in the Solomon Islands, and I think they did go and have a chat to these people. Liquid waste discharge impacts can be both chronic and, and acute. So often the acute impacts are the ones that people notice, like this, um, this plume that was coming out um, on the Great Barrier Reef on an island. It's actually not as bad as it looks. It's because of um, some iron chelates that were happening within an old pipe. So they were actually flushing the pipe and this is the chemical reaction of ions in the water column just turning the water black. So um, it can lead to a, a, a temporary um, stimulation of algal growth um, and then it looks very bad, doesn't smell, doesn't actually really um, drastically impact the um, overall long-term water quality, but that's what tourists see, that's what they photograph and um, it's, it's quickly noticed. Unfortunately for coral reefs, it's the more insidious um, chronic impacts of eutrophication and uh, pesticides and herbicides that are having the real impacts, not these sort of uh, much more visible plumes. And now, so during construction and um, even maintenance on a site, um, we have to consider how we're dealing with our waste. This, I thought, I filmed while I was in Fiji at one, one visit. So this is just cement wash being diverted off the site and into the drain running down the road. So this is obviously not happening within the construction zone, but it's going a long way away. And then it's going into the natural waterways. So what kind of things can they, can they be doing instead of just sort of flushing their, uh, their cement mixes or the cement areas down? Well. Um, they can have appropriate means. So there's containment. So just a simple um, bunding area, which could be as, as straightforward as a, um, a, a skip or a, or a metal containment. But it's very important that um, 
appropriately sized containers are used um, for the volume of wash you're going to have because they can quickly overfill as you can see and in the tropics even if you think you filled it at only 75% um, if it rains heavy um, it fills up fast so constant monitoring of your uh, of any bunded areas where you're you're containing liquid waste or um, settlement ponds so they don't have to be metal construction these ones are simple bales um, with a with a vinyl lining, but again, if they're not monitored regularly and pumped out, um, they can overflow in heavy rainfall or they can collapse if a vehicle um, um, gets too close and damages the sides. Um, other means which are maybe more e um, quickly set up and uh, able to be transported to other locations and reused, vinyl bunding bags. Um, this is a double bag system, so you have your inner bag, which you can um, remove and transport to a safe location for disposal once it becomes too full, and then just reinsert a new bag and continue. Likewise, when you're finished, you can pack up the whole thing and take it and use it on another site. So construction teams can use this kind of means. And it's really important that they do think about this when they're working on um, coastal developments or anywhere near a waterway, because cement wash is quite corrosive and can have a lot of impacts on um, both um, aquatic life and plant life. It can even burn your own skin. Um, still related to cement and um, building materials, uh, construction and maintenance of your developments um, is your aggregate sources. So when you make cement, you always need to use some sand and shell and in Samoa and parts of the Pacific, this is regularly coming from beaches because um, people see all that sand on the beach. It's often right next door to where they're constructing or down the road. They go, perfect material, I'll just scoop that up. Um, mm. What happens when they do that? We end up with runaway erosion. We can um, end up losing vegetation. We can encourage invasive species because things stick to trucks, tires, and get transported from one location to another. Um, and this is some potentially someone else's beach and someone else's livelihood. People come onto these foreshores to forage. And if sand is being removed, it destabilizes the whole marine environment. It can pollute waterways um, and can have impacts on even things like uh, palolo um, spawning. So yeah, sand harvesting as people call it, but it's not, it's sand mining, um, can be very impactful. And so a poorly managed one can have really bad effects. And it's happening not just in Samoa, it's happening all over the Pacific. Um, and it's, a, it's actually the UN has identified it as a global a problem because um, sand is actually um, running out. And I know that sounds weird when we talk about there's all this desertification. People sometimes say, well, why don't we just take sand from the Sahara? Unfortunately, it's actually marine sand and um, alluvial sands, which are the best sands because of the way the sand um, granules have um, square edges. Um, sand that's been blown around in the desert has been winnowed and rounded, and so it doesn't bind very well to cement. So people then always take it from essentially aquatic environments. The problem is sands are fluid. People don't necessarily understand that. They might think, okay, sand can act like a fluid when it's wet, but even when it's dry, it's still a fluid. It's always going to flow to the low points. So if you take it from one particular area, sand from or and similar silts will flow from a higher point into that area. So you're going to lose sand. If you take it from one point on the beach, um, wave action and wind and tides and even just gravity are going to cause sand from another part of the beach to migrate to try and fill that void. So you're going to end up with overall erosion and potentially runaway erosion. Other things to think of when you're doing your EIA and when you're planning your development. What type of waste are you gonna be generating? Not just during construction, but during the operations. And what are these waste streams? Can you break them up into streams? Can you identify your key hazardous waste? Do you know what you're gonna do with it? Where it's going to go? What are the volumes? Um, are there ways that you can very early on plan the way the run, the development is going to actually reduce these waste streams? because it's a huge problem in the Pacific, as I mentioned. Um, and, you know, things grow fast. So people often pile it up and then weeds grow over the top. It's not really seen until someone comes along and cuts the grass again. And then there's that really bad practice of burning it. And when you burn it, 
well, you know, Sprep has this whole campaign about pops. So, um, you know, we end up breathing it in. It gets into waterways and it pollutes farmland. So, yeah, that's not an option for plastics especially. So what sorts of things can we do? So early on, even in your planning, um, encourage the developers to think of even just small things that will appear small. So what type of packaging are they going to be um, serving their food in and their takeaway in? Um, within the Pacific and in Samoa, we have the single plastics ban. So single loose plastics shouldn't be being used in resorts anymore um, or anywhere on island, uh, but tourists will bring single use plastics with them. Um, no matter what you do, um, they're gonna have them in their bags because people wanna have, um, they think they're convenient to put their wet clothes in or carry them around. They'll bring duty free even comes in plastic bags. But within your resort, you can develop our policies. Um, as well, which can encourage, and in, in some instances, this is um, this is almost a selling point um, for a lot of um, developers, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But before I go into that, I want to talk about plastics um, and the more insidious uh, microplastics. So large plastics, everybody can see them. Certain ones, like container deposits and, and plastic bottles, can be easily picked up and and um, converted into cash in some in some countries, um, so that's that's happening. Um, and the larger the plastic, the easier it is generally to deal with. Once it breaks down, people tend to sort of overlook it, but this is the this is what is actually the real problem, and this is why it's a real problem for the environment. Um, it's not the plastics that are just sitting there, kind of appearing to be inert and just taking up space. It's the ones when they break down and when people think, oh, they're gone. These are the ones that are the problem. These are what they call the microplastics. This is anything below five millimeters. Some of these are large enough to be seen, but as they get smaller, they can be taken up by marine filter feeders, absorbed by animals, even consumed when they drink water. Um, plants take them up and absorb them into their materials. And ultimately that means we end up eating them. Um, so when you think that it's out of sight, it's, it should not be out of mind. Um, so this is, this is really important. And sources of these, and especially for tourism. Um, so when they're doing their laundry keeping, so microplastics um, from washing of, of bed sheets and things, if, if they're using plastics material um, based fabrics, this is gonna be releasing microplastics when they release their discharge water. Uh, if, if they're using cotton, that's much better. Um, microplastics also within cosmetics and cleaners are released and some, some tourism operators you know, within certain regions have introduced policies where they ban um, particular products being brought into their resorts. So this can be, um, there's an example of um, within Fiji, there's an island resort there, which is a no plastics island. So they're championing um, a plastics free resort and tourists who are coming to that resort have to sign basically an agreement that the only plastic they're gonna bring to the resort is their credit card or their debit card, because every other piece of plastic is not to be brought on. So even sunscreens, et cetera, are not permitted to come in in plastic containers. The resort will provide all of that for them. Um, so best practices to reduce these microplastics is basically stopping and collecting and recycling your larger plastics, and then putting in policies and codes to try and encourage patrons not to bring in um, cosmetics and other products to the resort that would contain microbead um, plastics. So often within some cosmetics now these days, unfortunately they're putting in these microbead scrubbers um, to help people's you know, complexion, but these are plastics. There are other things that resorts can do um, that sort of uh, part of their planning um, and mitigation um, once, they've, once they've established themselves again, they wanna maintain their reefs and they may have had some impacts on reefs when they were um, during construction, but then during operation, there's some examples of things that are happening within the region. Small scale um, restoration projects are even happening in Samoa. I know a couple of resorts that are uh, attempting these um, coral restoration projects. Now these are these can have longer term wider benefits, but essentially um, for the resort itself, it's a feel good exercise and it's a marketing thing. It's gonna bring in tourists. A lot of tourists wanna see coral. They wanna feel like they're coming and they're helping save the Pacific. So. If they put these plans in place, make sure that the plans are actually um, have some merit and it's not just um, purely a marketing exercise. 
know, what are they going to do with these corals? What type of corals are they going to grow? Make sure they're not taking corals from somewhere that's already stressed. Um, if, if they're uh, <clears throat> taking cuttings for, for grow on, um, you don't want them depleting one reef in order to restore another. Um, corals do grow quite well. There are various corals that grow better than others when you do this transplant technique. And then as well as, well as that, what sorts of materials are they using when they're um, fixing the coral to the ground again? Because you know, if they're using epoxies and things, they can be quite toxic. So simple plugs and screw-ins are, are, are much better. Um, but yeah, this is, this is being used across the region and um, it is actually helping to bring in some tourists um, and it was working quite well um, prior to lockdowns to encourage certain um, particular types of tourists to come. As I said, it's not uncommon for all entire islands to be within the coastal zone. So, you know, we've talked about the impacts of the development itself on the environment, but, you know, we have to consider constantly the impacts of the environment on, on the development. And uh, unfortunately, as it says on the slide, mother nature is not always kind. Uh, EIAs need to then take into consideration what are the potential impacts from the environment. So within the Pacific, we have to worry about cyclones and tsunamis. Um, so setting things back at, at high enough um, levels that they're going to be um, a lower risk of impacts. Working out where you sit uh, vulnerable amenities uh, for the development. So anywhere where there's chemical storage, make sure it's, it's in a very secure location where it's less likely to be flooded by um, heavy rains that might wash those chemicals into waterways um, and be... Um, in a secure area so that they're, they're not prone to, uh, to, to, to winds or um, there's not much you can do about a tsunami, unfortunately, but yeah, winds and heavy rains, we have to consider. The bottom um, left-hand corner photo is actually Brisbane, um, where they've, that's taken just this week from their uh, the heavy storms they've been having. Now, Brisbane has a big problem and you guys have a similar problem in, in Apia. Um, where there has been a lot of development within a, a river basin. And you can see there's like quite tall skyscrapers that surround the Brisbane River there. And what happens in heavy rain is all that hard stand, all those buildings, all those concrete areas just channel water straight into the river, which then quickly fills. Um, it's got nowhere to go. There's no natural soak left um, because all the vegetation, all the cleared um, natural grasslands are basically gone. What would normally be swamp and wetlands has been drained and then built upon. So it just concentrates the water. And then if water falls up upstream and in the in the natural catchment, it still then channels back down. So um, they have a real problem, and this is something that they're they're trying to deal with. And these events are happening more and more, um, not just in Brisbane, but you guys are, you know, I experienced uh, quite a few of those um, up until when I left. Uh, Samoa um, late last year, there was heavy rain events that, uh, that flood particular coastal zones, especially around up here. So when doing the EIA, we need to identify what are the, going to be the, the key things, key studies we need to undertake to determine the levels of impact. Um, for that, you, you need to engage a, a qualified consultant or a group of consultants who have the right skills you, you can't have botanists going out doing um, geology surveys. Likewise, you, it's, not, you know, it's not within a geologist's remit to go out and do stakeholder engagement. So make sure you've got the right people in the team when you're doing your EIA um, to write up and to design those monitoring programs. Um, that monitoring and data that's collected should be saved um, securely and provided to the government and the government should make that data um, available later on um, so that you can and other developers can compare notes essentially and compare databases. Um, those databases are really useful for building the national environmental database. And then the monitoring plan that goes on with the development once it's commenced. Now this should accompany your EIA. You need to have an environmental monitoring management plan. So you need to be able to monitor that your mitigation measures, your, your plan to put in place for your development are actually being effective and working. Um, if they're not, then they're gonna trigger um, potential uh, removal of your conditions. But if you do it right, you can actually use them as a trigger to work out and adapt your management plan. So you might need to um, then look at how you're capturing your wastewater or what you're putting into your drains and make sure that it's, it's being treated properly. 
um, and not triggering um, well, any of the triggers that have been set in place. So monitoring is very important and, and Joppe will talk a, a lot more about that on Friday. Okay, so you've heard me speak about the importance of sustainable planning and developments. Uh, we haven't been able to go into too much detail about the actual EIA process itself, but Tamara did a very good job of explaining how that works here in Samoa. Many of the principles that are being applied in existing developments, they can, so even if you have an existing development, the EIA principles of sustainable um, management and monitoring should still be getting applied. Um, we need to ensure that these things that affect or attract the tourists to the islands are, are, are remaining protected um, because if they get destroyed, well, you're not going to get as many tourists coming in. Um, so the EIA process relies on good stakeholder interaction. That's one of the key things that you have to you have to remember, and a good team of people utilizing the appropriate skills. Um, you need to reach out to technical support, and I've put some um, links up on this slide um, where you can get that. Don't forget that you can, as Tamara said, please go and speak to um, Puma as soon as possible. And the other members of the who are in this workshop right now, MNRE, STA, um, they all have a have a, a big role to play in any tourism development. So having those conversations early on is very important to planning a sustainable development and getting your application approved. I uh, thank you for your listening and I am now very keen to hear what you have to have to say. Thank you, Craig. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, uh, colleagues, uh, that is the presentation by Craig, uh, just uh, sharing with us what's contained in the Coastal Tourism Regional EIA guidelines and also some important elements for, for, for us to consider when uh, going through a tourism development application. I'll open the floor for any questions. There's silence around the room, Craig. There's silence around the room. Yeah, I, I picked that up. I was wondering if the mic went, but yeah, okay. You, you are loud and clear. Okay. Um, it's a later part of uh, the, the day and after a long discussion in the morning. But uh, this is what I suggest. Uh, since there is silence, may I request that uh, we, we continue with this discussion tomorrow morning mm. when uh, we'll meet here and maybe Let's go and refresh ourselves and come back. And maybe I allow some time uh, for some discussions. Or well, since yep. you've been creating, since you'll yep. be more session tomorrow, please prompt them to answer the ask some questions. Yeah. So that will be a good way forward. Is it okay, okay. Keep the day? Yes. And I know this, yes, correct. Uh, if I may. Yeah, that's a very good idea. Um but not letting everyone off the hook right now because uh, I just want to pose some questions to you. I mean, you can go away and think about them overnight and this can feed into the discussions tomorrow. So think about projects that you've reviewed, um, developments that you might even have on your desk at the moment. And what are the key issues when you look at that development um, that you are seeing, that you're facing? Like, What are the questions? You've got, you've got us all here um, over the next couple of days. What are the questions you want to put to us at SPREP or to your colleagues in MNRE or in STA or back to Puma or whoever else is sitting across the room from you? Um, what's the question you want to ask them? Because this is, this is really what this workshop is about. It's about networking the agencies and getting you guys to work better together.